Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Cycling Research Review, Interview Edition. And uh, today we're here with Kevin Kreisick at uh, Nectar 2019 in Helsinki. How are you doing, Kevin? We're good. Excellent. So just a few questions for you today. And uh, I've been following your work very closely and I, I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, so to start off, what uh, inspired you to write the, the 2011 paper, um, uh, A View from the Bicycle Path? So at that time, um, we were finishing up a major project for the city of Melbourne mm -hmm. in Australia, yeah. in which they commissioned work from myself and Anne Forsyth, who's uh, now at uh, Harvard University. We were both at the University of Minnesota at the time. And the, um, the question that they were trying to better understand was, given the burgeoning research in land use and transportation, and particularly walking and cycling, what can we now say with some degree of certainty about mm -hmm. what promotes or impedes people to either get on a bike or walk? Uh, what do we know from the canvas of literature? Um, two, 200 studies, I believe, that yeah. we, we tried to get our hands on and look at the variety of kind of attitudinal factors, but more so the built environment factors and maybe some uh, promotional or campaign type, uh, what they call soft measures. And we saw that there was a lot coming from engineering. Mm -hmm. We saw that there was a lot coming from urban planning and that placemaking uh, literature, which was able to tell us a lot. Yeah. But when you further peeled back different layers of the onion, it became readily apparent to us that, wow, there's something about this speed of movement that we don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about car movement. We know a lot about pedestrian movement. Uh, we, we actually know a lot about transit. Yeah. yeah. But there was not a lot about uh, how people perceive the visual environment or their spatial cognition. Uh, you know, going at, say, 12 miles per hour, 20 kilometers per hour th through cities mm -hmm. and how there was a different level of appreciation for the built environment. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in that respect. So uh, we decided to kind of look through the prism of this new um, need for, for research and say, wow, there might be something different about this mode mm -hmm. that we need to better inventory uh, for future researchers to pick up. And, 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 and so we came up with these different factors of um, criteria and how the different mindsets are possibly uh, compared to what uh, compared to walk, walking and, and, and motorized travel and uh, you know there's it, it's more of a um, not necessarily a theoretical contribution but it's helping pave the way for future researchers to look at these issues with with greater scrutiny mm -hmm. and how did that work then carry forward to your most recent paper about uh, considering more qualitative aspects in uh, studying cycling uh, it's, it's a direct descendancy yeah. uh, from that so uh, subsequent to, to that paper, uh, actually can comment it with, with simultaneously with that, we were looking at how measures of accessibility mm -hmm. uh, could be used to better predict where future infrastructure investments should be uh, placed and how we can better measure accessibility, again, from an auto perspective, from a walking perspective, but nobody, nobody really did this from a cycling perspective. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so that fast forward to the notion that we have travel time savings, which is often the mobility function mm -hmm. that is trying to be minimized uh, in accessibility equations. So if something's closer, it's gonna be more accessible. Yeah. Now, if something's of shorter travel distance, it's gonna be more attractive. This is not always the case. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a linear function going forward with respect to people's desire to, to want to minimize travel. And so does this possibly vary by, by mode? And yeah, I think that it does vary by mode and it varies considerably by mode insofar as there is more, there are more arrows pointing to the fact that there is a positive utility provided to bicycle travel. Mm -hmm. What is that positive utility? It varies by individuals. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it's, um, you know, the cog cognitive benefits. Sometimes it's the actual wind through your hair. Sometimes it's the physical activity uh, that, you're, that you're receiving. These are all going to vary by individual. Mm -hmm. 
But accessibility measures, unfortunately, do not have a capability to capture those phenomena. Mm -hmm. But yet, a place is still accessible to other individuals by bicycling if we um, take these considerations into, into effect. Wonderful. So, uh, again, this r recent contribution was a call to action for uh, subsequent researchers to better understand how these kind of, call them hedonic, call them autotelic, intrinsic is the uh, label that I used in this mo most recent contribution, how those elements could be better weighed into measures of accessibility. Thank you. In relation to your field of expertise, what problems are academics struggling most with these days? And how can a better conceptualization of these problems help us understand the world better? That is a outstanding challenge. <laughs> Sorry. A, a, very good, a very good question, outstanding challenge. The world is changing so fast with respect to our industry, transportation mm. right now. And there is a tendency to say, oh, well, what happened in the past is we're going to better understand that and project yeah. it into the future. There's an inherent difficulty with that, given our uh, proclivity for wanting to do that. And that's the whole basis for getting a PhD, is to understand the complexity of mm -hmm. a particular issue and then translate it to some sort of future practi practice or policy. So we need to better understand that, or at least recognize that, that anything that we're trying to understand about the past is going to be limited. And so um, any models that are created, any kind of forecasts that are based on the past data collection e exercises are going to be challenged on that, uh, on that account. Mm -hmm. That's not to say we shouldn't do it, that's just to say that we need to be mindful of it and weigh the strengths and limitations of any modeling approach or past um, reconciliation of, of, of trends in, into future conditions. The second has to do with the I think the complexity by which travel decisions are made in cities. And we know that the travel making decision is really messy. Mm -hmm. What we have a harder time understanding is the uh, degree to which a study that is performed in context X could have validity to context Y, the external validity here. Mm -hmm. And we often say, oh, well, you know, the cycling infrastructure land use transportation pattern in the Netherlands is XYZ, therefore we can cop copy and paste. To, we hear that a lot. <laughs> and that is a um, uh, often suggested remedy yeah. for yeah. cities in, the, in North America. And I don't think that, uh, you know, the Dutch cycling embassy, they know how to, for example, understand what's going on in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. The challenge comes in exporting that to cities that are, have no characteristics to the Netherlands. Yeah. And so uh, being mindful of what works and what doesn't work. And that's uh, not to say that we can't go out on a limb to suggest something, but when we do go out on a limb, we've got to say, well, we'll be careful of this, be careful of that. Yeah. And so um, that is a, a, a um, element of PhD research, I think, that is often underappreciated because you want to come up with all the answers to all the world now. The whole world, right now, yeah. And God bless your soul and your desire to want to do that. <laughs> the most important thing for you to have is, you know, a drive in your heart mm -hmm. for, for these types of questions. I mean, if you don't have a drive in your heart for these types of questions and trying to understand the complexity and then apply your brain to peel back this layer and that layer, uh, to look in through this crack and say, okay, now I've understood this situation and I'm going to uh, uh, describe or explain the external validity of it as best I can uh, to the research world. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you got to be passionate. You got to know the limitations of what you're trying to say and understand that uh, anything that's in the past is going to have some sort of um, reliability uh, that people are going to say, huh, that's not the way that I thought the world works. Yeah. It's to change how other people see the world yeah. through the process. Uh, with that, do you have uh, any other advice for uh, young academics? Like, I'm thinking myself like three years into the game out of a four-year PhD, almost there. Uh, or if you're just starting out from a PhD, is there any tips and tricks to get started? Well, I think the first one that I just mentioned is yeah. having a passion, having some sort of fire in your belly. Uh, the research questions and 
you know, the one that you come in for looking at the beginning of your PhD is probably going to be considerably different than the one mm -hmm. that you're actually doing three years into your yeah. PhD. Now, I think this differs by program and context. Uh, nonetheless, the second is to go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> is, is, is to just go for it in, in, in every respect and then rely on your committee to s suggest, okay, well, you maybe if you peel back this or uh, leave out this part, mm -hmm. and maybe leave out this part, you'll have a more internally co co consistent uh, research uh, uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to t thinking m more small, yeah. uh, smaller, and saying, well, I'm going to think uh, very carefully about this one issue, and I'm going to think very carefully about this issue, and then after three or four years, I'm going to try and piece them together and say, whoa, uh, I didn't, those don't match together as well as I thought that they <laughs> and do. And you're kind of stuck. And, and, and then you're out. kind of stuck at that point. Mm -hmm. So you got to go for it with respect to uh, thinking aggressively, thinking ambitiously about what you can do, and then um, start to assemble mm -hmm. the, the, the storyline. Hey, so uh, Kevin, where can they find you and your work on the internet? Uh, KevinJKrasik.org mm -hmm. or Vehicle for a Small Planet. Vehicle for a Small Planet. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. much. So to learn more about uh, Kevin Kreisik and his most recent works, uh, check out the links below. And also be sure to check out episode number three, where I reviewed his paper, Urban Design, Is There a Distinctive View from the Bicycle? Thank you very much, and I'll see you shortly. Thanks, George.